What up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Jam Report. I'm your host, Pablo. Joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, Loki has arrived. There have been many people who already have had the special privilege of watching the first two episodes and you know they got to do what they got to do to get the buzz out and it's been positive brian there and and there have been some who haven't been impressed just yet um, again, there are people that have already seen one and two, so hopefully the second one sort of gets us even in a, in a, in a better uh, state with regards to, to to how good Loki is. Brian, how did you receive the first episode of Loki? What did you think? I really enjoyed it. Um, I think considering... Me too. You know, considering we've changed showrunners and we've changed writers, so Eric Martin is now the I writer. I was very impressed Michael, with that. Michael Waldron. And we don't have Kate Heron directing. We've got Benson and Moorhead, who had worked on some of Moon Knight um, previously. I liked the look of it. I liked the dialogue. Once again, even though there's a lot of jargon in here about, you know, time slipping and the multiverse, for some reason, this show does a better job of containing it in a way that I can both follow and be interested in. I thought Kiai Kwan was great as OB. And I think we were left with some interesting possibilities um, mm -hmm. in terms of what we were kind of touching on in terms of uh, the, the Kangs, the kind of Loki we saw. And then obviously, you know, Sylvie winding up in, in spoiler alert, 1982, Oklahoma. Was, um, that, the spo was that the post credit? Yeah. I didn't see the post credit. Yeah, so she she basically winds up at a McDonald's in Oklahoma in 1982. I like Hilston is doing something different, right? He is now like the panicked messenger of doom, right? He's kind of telling everyone like, "You're dead. You're you're, you're screwed. You have to, you know, like." And that's a, that's a good role for him. He's a nice change from sort of the suave Loki that that he was at the start of season one. So, um, no, I, I I like I said, I like the visuals too. Like this is not a like a. He, he, yeah, this CGI with the, the timeline and stuff like that. But this is not really like a set piece action type of show. So it relies on the acting and the dialogue. And it moved, man. I had no problems watching it. I watched it twice. I watched it once by myself and then once with my daughter. She really liked it too. I was hoping that they would have released both of them when I looked. And I, I was pretty, I was disappointed to only see one episode. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess it's worth waiting for. So let's see. Fair, but I would say where the first episode ended, it made a little more sense to me because it's like, right, they set up a few pieces. TVA is sending an army after Sylvie, so clearly there's an agenda there. And then we kind of get the Sylvie post credit scene. So I think had you tacked on another episode to that, it maybe it would have worked, but they kind of cliff, they did the cliffhangers correct in my view in terms of like, all right, we gave you a <clears throat> re-intro. We've introduced this problem of the time slip, right, that Loki's going through which then sets the stage for the time travel that we know is going to happen and kind of bring um, other versions of Kang into play. So I, th I thought it was very effective, uh, very effective first episode. And we didn't, you know, we held some characters back, right? There's no Renslayer, um, no Miss Minutes. There's the big question, I don't know what your thoughts are, who pruned him at the end? That to me is the big like, he gets pruned in the nick of time in the future TVA to then go back and save himself and save Mobius. But we don't know who, he couldn't have pruned himself because he lost the stick. The stick was in the present. So who pruned him? That, that I think is one of the big like questions the episode left out there, which I'm assuming we'll get an answer to. What did you think of, um, I didn't get a chance to listen to any of the breakdowns from those, those YouTubers who do that sort of thing. Um, but I did notice there was some dialogue between Renslayer and Kang mm -hmm. or uh, whatever version of Kang. What did you think of that? And uh, what was your reaction to that? Well, I mean, the comics, they are romantically linked. So that yes. was recording was sort of the first sign of that in some ways. 
Um, and I think obviously it was played twice kind of for effect. So clearly they, they, they want you to focus in on that relationship, which I'm assuming will get explored. So no, I liked it. I like, you know, we know that Jonathan Majors, you know, the legal problems are still unresolved, but I thought obviously this show was crafted before that came to light. And in some ways I like the fact that we heard Kang's voice and we saw Kang's likeness in statue, but we didn't actually see him in any form. I think that's actually a better way to reintro. I think it'd be Victor um, timely, timely in, in, in this one. So I thought that was like, a, again, this show does a nice job of holding, holding things back when it, when it needs to. Did it build some anticipation for you to see his performance? Yes, of course. I mean, like the, the, legal, the legal stuff is one thing. The performance is, not, is another and has never been questioned. So like, you know, if he's going to be there and obviously this was shot before he had the, the legal troubles, like he's, he's a magnetic type of actor. Um, so yeah, no, I can't wait to see his performance as Victor Timely. I can't wait to see him operating in different, you know, timelines potentially in this. So no, a hundred percent. And I think we'll see if this show delivers on the premise but Loki has clearly grasped the gravity of what we have seen in Quantum Mania as the Council of Kangs, right? So that's one of the interesting <clears> things <throat> where you know, we forget that I mean, Quantum Mania was a disappointing film. But we as an audience have seen the Council of Kangs. So we've seen the visualization of what Loki is imagining based yeah. on he who remains description. So his fear, right? This is still a god, literally, who's expressing this type of fear to people, I think it's significant. I mean, I think the show I would think is trying to communicate that because we're going to see something terrifying at some point. Yeah, I was thinking of, of Loki because this one in this season, he is going to be more, portrayed more like a heroic figure rather than the villain because of what he is trying to, I guess, preserve or, or, or avoid, I guess. Loki's existence is to cause mischief, mischief in a world that he is able to do so without uh, the interference of someone like a king, right? Or, uh, uh, so how they are able to, to do that at the end of this is, is, is something that I'm looking forward to seeing. Yeah, I mean, it's all on the path to, I think, inevitably, Loki's going to be part of the Avengers. I mean, he ha almost has to be. And I think it's kind of a shame, given what we know about the rest of the Avengers, but and that's where this is headed. Um, and clearly, this show will have connections to Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars, so we'll see. But Hiddleston always finds a way to give you something new uh, that's what i love about his his portrayal is whether it's physical whether it's his physical acting which i think in this episode he does a lot of physical acting he's kind of like tossing himself around and moving very suddenly and things we like gotta that. count the, the the hair flips hair flips i would say that we we're talking about like a signature <laughs> move now um but then also the, his yeah his as i said his emotional state right this is an agitated fearful loki which is very different than what we were what we've been used to so i i like it i like that he finds new notes uh, to play because Mobius was still kind of Mobius, right? If we're being, yeah. if we're being honest, that's not bad, but that's Owen Wilson being Owen Wilson. I also say visually, I liked the quick cutting between past, present, future. I think the show did a very nice job in some of the scenes with OB of the continuity. Like even my kid was, was able dope. to follow what was happening and the, and the dialogue and the conversation. I was like, this is clever. Like this show is better at this than other Marvel things. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would, I would probably say, Brian. I think it has to. Does does Todd, Tom Hiddleston have a lot to do with the the production of of this show? The rumor is yes. The rumor is yes. Is that he has a lot of influence over this? Yes. Anything else, Brian? Uh, I would say I hope this show sticks to uh, this idea that. The strength of the show is never going to be in big action and fights because that's not really what Loki's about. This episode didn't have that. The first season really didn't have that. This is about well-written characters delivering speeches, 
having conversations and those conversations leading us to interesting places. And if, that's why I was very satisfied that the first episode didn't try to say like, hey, we got to be bigger and different and have more explosions. It was no, it was the same idea. People talking, telling us things we needed to know and asking interesting questions. Yeah. Yeah. And those are the, those, I guess, Brian, are the uh, parts that I enjoy the, enjoy the most. And not to um, to to go on a tangent, but one of my favorite scenes, just speaking on that, one of my favorite scenes is Daredevil and Punisher on the roof. Yeah, and them yeah. having that conversation. I go back to that scene, Brian every once in a while just when i just want to be reminded of what good storytelling and good characterizations are look like mm -hmm. Shh. oh my do yourselves a favor and watch it man just that i think it's episode what like three or four i forget two but it's uh, episode uh, two it's episode two yes yes yeah <laughs> you just gotta you just gotta watch it yes let us know in the comments below what you guys think of the loki premiere was it disappointing based off of what people have been saying Loki is remember those people saw two episodes so they may be I've, I haven't I, I'm, I, I, I try not to read any reviews before I've seen anything Brian but I would sus sus suspect for those people who had the privilege of watching the first two episodes may say that you need to watch the first two episodes in order to appreciate what the first episode did. I don't know. Um, but I enjoyed it. Uh, and it seems that you've enjoyed it, Brian. Uh, my son enjoyed it, but he, yet again, again, he enjoys everything. <laughs> Marvel. So I don't count his uh, ex enthusiasm. But I, I definitely enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to the second episode, man. I wish I would have released two of them. I wish they would have released two of them. Anything else, Brian, before we sign out? No. Can't, I just said, can't wait for episode two. Very satisfying yeah. to get a Marvel episode of TV that we could be <laughs> celebrating for once. It's where you can escape the reality that the MCU is whack right now. <laughs> That's what the that's what Loki does. That's what Guardians of the Galaxy did. Fair. And that's what Loki has done. Uh, we'll see you next time on the Nerd Gym Report. The show goes on! Yeah!